Well, thank you, James. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, everybody. It's fun to be here in a different capacity up here this morning. Um, as James said, I do feel as though I need to say, and now for something completely different, because I don't have big data sets to share with you. Uh, and uh, so I, what I do want to talk about is the work that we've been doing at UCLA with Arcadia, um, but also just talk a little bit about Arcadia. Now, I, I have to give a disclaimer, because actually you were supposed to hear from Dr. Maya Kominko, who's uh, the, one of the program officers at Arcadia, who had thought she could come today and would be able to talk really from the most informed perspective about Arcadia. Uh, but unfortunately, she had another sudden commitment that came up and wasn't able to travel here. So I'm stepping in for her. So picture me with a much more charming accent <laughs> and a very different style. So um, I thought first, though, before I talk about Arcadia, that I would talk a little bit about UCLA and our area studies programs. UCLA has been deeply invested in area studies for decades, uh, practically since UCLA began. And actually, UCLA is not quite 100 years old, so we're still pretty young as a campus. Uh, but area studies and Title VI has been important. We have a number of centers on campus. We have a number of majors and minors. And the library throughout the years has really focused on developing rich and deep collections. So we have had subject specialist librarians covering many areas of the world. And actually, one is here today, Ruby Belgam, um, who does Africa, is here today. Uh, and so our traditionally, our area specialists have been funded to acquire the traditional printed literature, often having to travel to the areas they're responsible for um, and, uh, and create connections there and contacts. But uh, now starting to think about how the world has changed and how our collecting patterns need to change. So enter Arcadia. I have a pop quiz for you. Any ideas why I have this with me today? Uh, <laughs> somebody who knows. It's, what, what is it? It's a carton of milk. It's Tetra Pak. Tetra Pak is described in one article I read as those useful but annoying plastic-coated paper cartons which on a bad day are nearly impossible to open without spilling milk over yourself. Love them or hate them, they are one of the world's most pervasive throwaway items. About 200 mil million are sold and discarded every day. This is the source of the money that funds Arcadia. So people often ask, you know, I haven't heard of Arcadia. What is the money from? It is from these Tetra Pak packages. So Arcadia as a fund was established by Lisbeth Rousing, who's uh, one of the heirs to the funding, and Peter Baldwin, her husband. Um, and Peter Baldwin has been on the faculty at UCLA for a number of years. He's now retired from UCLA, um, but he, I, he has been, he and Lisbeth have been quite generous to UCLA in terms of supporting programs and, uh, and actually endowing faculty positions at UCLA. Um, several decades ago, about 20 years ago, um, they decided to establish a charitable fund uh, that they describe as serving humanity by preserving endangered cultural heritage and ecosystems. We protect complexity and work against the entropy of ravaged and thereby starkly simplified natural environments and globalized cultures. Innovation and change occur best in already complex systems. 
So Arcadia has selected a number of institutions, primarily in Britain and the US, to fund. And uh, they have been giving funding out, as I said, for a couple of decades. Uh, so I thought today I would spend a little time talking about some of the major programs that they've been working on that are really related to area studies, but in different ways than the traditional ways libraries have gone about uh, collecting for area studies. So one of the first of these is the Endangered Archives Program, or EAP, that's hosted at the British Library. The Endangered Archives Program began in 2004 and uh, has funded more than 300 projects in 90 countries worldwide, resulting in over 6.5 million images and 25,000 soundtracks being preserved. They are very proud that in addition to being accessible through local archival partners, this growing archive of material is available freely on the EAP website. So one of Arcadia's core beliefs is in open access. And when they talk about open access, they mean not only changing the scholarly communication system and trying to make it much more open, but also in ensuring that the materials that are gathered and preserved through the projects they fund are openly available on the web. And uh, they, they really encourage their, the funding recipients to try to make as much material available as quickly as possible and to do the work necessary to have metadata to describe it and, and to make it use, usable. So the EAP, as I said, has had uh, more than 300 projects. Here are just a few examples of some of the types of projects they have funded. The EAP funds projects in uh, less developed parts of the world where is, there is limited infrastructure for digitization. Uh, they also uh, have been focused on the pre-industrial era. So there's no fixed date for the uh, EAP projects, but they should be pre-industrial. And uh, they give grants out every year. They have a cycle through which grants are, proposals are solicited. They have an international panel of experts who consider the proposals and they evaluate them based on the urgency of need, the vulnerability of the material, the significance in terms of scholarly or, and research access, the feasibility of the project. In other words, is it possible to actually carry out this digitization project? The age of the material, the expertise and experience of the applicant, the provision for development of local staff, because they're very interested in trying to expand the knowledge base in these locations that have had limited uh, access to the kinds of training and support they need. And then also the commitment to provide access that I talked about. So they really focus on materials as much as possible that aren't going to be caught up with copyright issues or other kinds of issues that will limit their accessibility. A second project that, the, that Arcadia has funded is the Endangered Languages Documentation Program, which is at the School of African and Oriental Studies at the University of London. Uh, and this project is dedicated to trying to preserve languages that are rapidly disappearing. As the director of the program said, nearly half of the 7,000 world's languages spoken today will have fallen silent by the end of this century due to globalization and urbanization. So the Endangered Languages program works very hard to go out and gather, uh, gather documentation and linguistic document those languages. Uh, so they have two types of projects. Uh, one is a legacy materials grant 
uh, that they will give out to digitize different types of materials that actually uh, describe a language or provide some context for a language. So it can be photographs, other AV materials, or it can be actual documents themselves. They also give documentation grants, and those are available to linguists who, or people who have the requisite linguistic knowledge to be able to go visit a community, talk to people who actually speak the language that's endangered and document that language. Uh, the Endangered Language Documentation Project was originally funded by Arcadia in 2002, and uh, it moved to the School of Oriental and African Studies Library in 2014. There is an archive of the um, language materials that, again, is openly available on the web. And Arcadia does continue to fund these, these kinds of grants. Uh, they operate in a similar way to the Endangered Archives program, where there's a, a cycle of doing a call for proposals, and then people can submit different kinds of proposals. There's a review process, and a decision is made about the, whether or not the project can be funded. So I mentioned that, that Arcadia is very interested in open access. They have an open access and digital preservation policy. They take open access very seriously. And within the last two years, they've actually hired a program officer for open access. And as I understand it from conversations with the program officer, they expect to expand the scope of their open access funding. So for those of us who are also interested in these issues of, of getting materials out and available to the world without putting them behind paywalls, Arcadia is positioned to be a, an even more significant player in this realm. So switching gears a bit, at UCLA, Arcadia has funded for us something that we call the International Digital Ephemera Project. This funding uh, was given to UCLA six years ago, um, which was um, when my predecessor, Gary Strong, was the university librarian. Uh, and Gary had submitted a proposal to Arcadia that said, we want to be able to go out to capture digital ephemera or, or digitize ephemera and make it widely available on the web, but do it in a way that both provides expertise to the communities and the organizations that we're working with, and it doesn't require the materials to come to UCLA. So over the last six years, we have established partnerships with a number of libraries and cultural heritage organizations uh, in, in a number of countries around the world. So Armenia, Cuba, Egypt, Iraq, South Africa, those are some of the countries where we've been doing work. We've often used connections that UCLA faculty have to establish the relationships with these cultural heritage organizations. So, uh, for instance, in the case of Cuba, we made contact with two faculty who traveled regularly to Cuba and took students there to study. We sent a team of librarians to join them on one of their trips to Cuba, and then that's how they made connections to the National Library in Cuba, the Instituto de de Historica, the Cinematica de Cuba. So we've, we've tried to make it a project that engages our faculty and students as well as just the library. So here's an example of um, a particular project we've done. Um, one of our partners is Freedom Park in South Africa. Um, Freedom Park came into being after the former President Nelson Mandela announced in Parliament in 1999 that 
The day shall not be far off when we shall have a people's shrine, a freedom park where we shall honor with all the dignity they deserve those who endured pain so we can experience the joy of freedom. Freedom Park was established in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the nation to create a monument and memorial that celebrates those who sacrificed their lives for a free and democratic South Africa. One thing I learned through this project and through working with our uh, one of our history faculty members at UCLA is how much memory is being lost in South Africa, how little record there is of the apartheid era and all the efforts that went into um, preserving apartheid on the part of the, the government. So we recently, oops, sorry, I skipped back. We recently put up a collection of Afri comics that were published in 1975 to 1977 as part of a five-year secret propaganda war that was led by the Secretary of the Department of Information in the South African government from 1972 until 1977 to defend apartheid. Uh, these comics were published, published two titles in large press runs, and they were, according to the, the words of one of the collaborators on the publication, they were to help educate the black man in the ways of Western society, social concerns, and free enterprise. And I'm quoting here from the essay that, that Professor Bill Warger wrote to accompany this. So these comics are extremely rare, uh, and they, but they help document that period of history that Freedom Park is dedicated to and for which they are, um, they are trying to locate materials and make them available. So by having these digitized uh, materials available to them, we hope to encourage others to produce if they happen to have other issues of these comics or if they have other materials that they think would be appropriate. We're really hoping to help build that collection collaboratively with Freedom Park. So in working with our various partners, there have been a lot of great things, great aspects to these projects. Um, and I, it's been different than, than just the, the relationships that we had in the past in terms of collecting. We're forming much deeper collaborative relationships with them, and in many cases, we're signing memoranda of understanding and agreeing to really work on projects going forward. So we're, we're not just viewing this as sort of a one-off. We go, we meet a partner, we help make sure that material gets digitized. We get copies, they get copies, the materials stay where they are, and then we're done. No, it's really about building this network. We talk about it as a hub and spoke network also, where we want to have maybe one cultural heritage organization in a particular geographic area that's the lead organization, and then they can establish connections with other organizations in their region so that, again, all these organizations can benefit. Part of what we do is work with our partners to ensure that these materials are adequately preserved. Uh, and that includes uh, preservation of AV material and born digital content. So for instance, uh, in our Cuba projects, um, we, we sent our preservation, um, the, our head of preservation and our AV preservation librarian to Cuba to work with people there and to help them actually preserve their materials. So um, our AV preservation librarian wrote a, a blog post about preserving radio broadcasts in Cuba. And I'll just read you the first paragraph, um, which is, 
How do you transport over 140 pounds of supplies and equipment to Cuba to digitize nearly 70-year-old radio broadcasts that were recorded on an extremely fragile format without the luxury of shipping services and with limited internet access at your destination for troubleshooting? So it's, it's been a really challenging project, but this help and uh, assistance with preservation has been a key component. Uh, working with the National Library of Armenia, one of the things they have really uh, asked us for is, again, to send our conservator who can help them work on manuscripts that they have that uh, where they know there's been some damage over the centuries and they want to be sure that they're doing all they can. So by, by helping our partners with both preservation and digitization, we really feel as though we're strengthening the knowledge base around the world, and particularly in regions where there's been limited support in the past. And we find that our partners are extremely receptive and uh, have, have really worked with us and, again, formed this deeper relationship than just a sort of acquaintanceship. Um, the materials are used uh, for research and teaching. As I mentioned, we work with UCLA faculty around uh, gathering, uh, well, identifying partners and then gathering materials, and then we encourage them to use the materials in their classes. And through this, we've really changed the nature of our partnerships with faculty because we're working with them in a different way. They view us really as equal partners because they understand that it's, it's the expertise that we're providing and the, the equipment, the skills, the knowledge that really helps develop these partnerships. Uh, challenges are similar to some of the challenges we've talked about already uh, in the last uh, 24 hours. Uh, international politics is um, a constant challenge, and obviously um, uh, the, the situation changes. Um, we've had issues with um, getting to Cuba. Uh, we're also, we've got a project going with the Palestinian Museum, and we had had trips scheduled uh, for them to come to Los Angeles and for us to send a team to meet with them but those trips have had to be postponed. So it's, it's politics is a, a big challenge and really affects what we're able to do. Connectivity, I read you the, the little snippet from the blog post. It's a challenge in some of these areas. In others, it's not a problem. But Cuba in particular, we've ended up having to send people with little thumb drives and, and they load everything up and come back, or they leave a supply of those, and then on their next trip, they pick them all up and they bring them back. And equipment, many places don't have the equipment, so we have provided that, and that's one area where having external funding has made all the difference, because as a public institution, a state-funded institution, we cannot give away state property, but we can Give, we've been able to convince export control at UCLA that by showing them that we have the approval from our funder, we're able to actually leave the equipment and then our partners can use that equipment not only for the projects that we work with them on, but we hope for other projects. Meeting deadlines, again, this is um, something that did come up uh, in our in earlier presentations. Um, uh, all of the little glitches that come up in terms of shipping equipment, having scheduling travel, uh, just getting work done have meant sometimes we've had to go back to Arcadia and beg forgiveness for not meeting the deadlines that we had originally agreed to because it's just been hard to do that. Uh, and then another challenge has been the issue of personal safety. Um, because some of the areas that uh, people travel to are not necessarily the safest, or even in a, a safe place such as Armenia, 
uh, one of the people we sent got hit by a car while she was there. And so, you know, there are, are just challenges that we have to think about and be prepared for. So we've built a website. It's uh, online, idep.library.ucla.edu, that has uh, the content from our various partners. We've digitized a lot, and we're still in the process of uploading the content. It is, um, we're trying to make it a fully uh, multilingual interface, so I wanted to show you on this screen, we've got the different languages and we have to display differently depending on it, whether it's a language that's left to, displayed left to right or right to left. That's one of the technical challenges we've had to figure out. So I, just to give you a brief comparison of these three Arcadia-funded projects, uh, the Endangered Archives, Endangered Languages, and International Digital Ephemera, um, the, there are some significant differences um, in that the International Digital Ephemera Project is one where we've been the proactive ones whereas EAP and ELDP have been projects where people who are interested in getting funding actually apply for the funding. But in all of these, the intent is that the material remains in its, in its home and that digitized content is then put up openly on the web so that everybody is, is able to access it. So overall, as I think about our area studies collecting and what influence the in International Digital Ephemera Project has had on us, I think uh, I would say that, that we are spending much more time and energy trying to acquire ephemeral content as opposed to just the traditional published record. It doesn't mean that we're not getting the published record, but we're trying to get this other content as well because we do believe that a lot of it documents the present. As, as Cliff was talking about, it's not, it's not the technical present, but it is the present as it exists in other parts of the world and we're able to, to uh, digitize it. So. Um, American University of Iraq Suleimani has gone around and gathered material from someone who was in the Abu Ghraib prison. And so that has been digitized and we've put that up on the web. And having this growing network of partnerships around the world is really helping us find collections and think about whether we can do new projects and when the Arcadia funding runs out, whether there are ways that we'll be able to figure out a funding stream internally so that we can continue this work. Um, again, I've talked about these other points, but I think it's th there has been a fundamental shift in our thinking about how we do these projects. And there's also been creation of a sense of teamwork in the library because it's not just our area studies collectors, but our whole digital library uh, team works on all of these projects. And we've had other librarians with other kinds of expertise who've been drawn in. I mentioned our conservators, um, also um, our, our GIS librarian, before he departed, uh, worked on one of our projects. So this has really involved a lot of people across the library. It's involved um, our technical services people who've helped with metadata. We've developed a metadata toolkit that's been uh, translated into multiple languages that we provide to our partners to give them assistance in describing the materials. So there have been some lasting changes. And recently, we've become aware that of a couple of other foundations that are um, considering these kinds of projects as important to fund. So the Prince Klaus Fund for Culture and Development is one of those, and the Whiting Foundation is another where 
uh, they're at least talking about this. We have not received funding from them, so um, I am not saying that, that they are actively doing this now, um, but they are definitely on the radar screen in terms of their interest in making sure that what's disappearing now can be, can be preserved and made available for the future. So uh, Arcadia continues to provide funding. They, um, they have recently renewed the funding to the British Library for the Endangered Archives Program and expect to go forward with that. Um, we're hoping that they'll uh, continue funding us to do more of this work. Uh, and we know that they have a commitment. They've funded projects at Harvard, Yale, Columbia, uh, and uh, the various other cultural heritage organizations, as well as the British Library, the British Museum. Um, so they are definitely committed to this. And I think we're quite fortunate that they are making this, this funding available because I think it does help preserve this content for the future. So. Anybody want milk? <laughs> Hi, Jenny. David Mager from Princeton. And we've also been involved in a large-scale Latin American ephemera project that we're right now expanding to uh, aggressive um, digitization and open access presentation on the web for other world areas. So we should talk. But uh, <laughs> um, I just uh, was interested in a kind of methodological question. It sounds like um, your scope for, uh, I'm focusing on the ephemera at the moment, your scope for the building the collection is both historical and contemporary ephemera. Is that right? That's correct, yes. We had, um, several years ago, we had a lot of discussion about how we wanted to define ephemera, and in the end, we decided that we were going to be pretty loose about that both in terms of um, its age and also the particular type of ephemera. So yes, we've been very broad. And methodologically, in terms of getting your hands on the right stuff to meet those um, goals, do you find it's more effective to work with cultural organizations as you sort of define them in the countries as opposed to the actual producers of the ephemera itself? The, you know the flyers that come from the social movements, the different NGOs and advocacy groups and so on? So we've, we've done both. I would say um, more working with the cultural heritage organizations than the actual producers. But, but in some cases, um, uh, the Cinematica de Cuba did a, a large collection of posters, and they're both the producers and holders. So that's a case where we go to them as well. Um, so it really varies depending on the location and the type of content. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pamela Graham, Columbia. Um, I wondered if you could provide an example of a born digital um, project, and I wonder if the structure of collaboration is any different in those cases, since there wouldn't be a physical uh, artifacts that one has to travel and, and work with um, on site. So um, one of our born digital projects was actually cell phone videos from the green movement. Uh, and these came to us, they were brought to us by someone who um, had gathered them, who'd been active himself and who had gathered them and had come to the U.S. and actually is now a U.S. citizen. Um, so he gave us these cell phone videos and those presented um, different, different types of challenges for us, one of which was a concern about whether or not we could show people's faces and what the security implications and personal safety implications would be for them. Um, so, so that's um, one area of gathering um, born digital content. We also have gathered uh, Twitter feeds about Arab Spring. 
And uh, again, as Cliff was talking about the, the enormity of the size of these data sets, we've been working on figuring out how to provide visualization tools to make so that people can use that material and actually make sense of it. And that's been another challenge for the digital library people because they're, they're trying to figure out how, what do we do with this? We've got all of this, but reading one tweet after another, uh, that's just, <laughs> That's not going to get a researcher anywhere. Thank you for a very interesting <laughs> program um, presentation. There were two IDEP partners at the bottom of the list that you didn't mention. One is Kashkul. I confess my ignorance. Tell, me, tell Please explain where that is and what programs you were doing there. And the other was the National Library of Israel. Okay, so let me start with the National Library of Israel first. Um, they have a, um, they have been digitizing materials that uh, are from their collection and they call it, I believe, the time travel collection. I'm trying to um, recall the exact title of it. and. Uh, when we got the funding from Arcadia, they were, they were working with the National Library of Israel, and they were concerned that we would, that NLI would not be able to um, gather and preserve all of this content. It was early days for them, and so they asked us to work together in partnership. So um, we're actually um, just mirroring a lot of the content from their site, but providing a different kind of, uh, of access to that content through, the, um, through our IDEP website. And uh, we're just hoping that that will, will draw new people to that content and make it more accessible. It's hard to know because I think a lot of people will end up going to the National Library of Israel anyway, but it's, it is. So um, Kashkul is Middle East and it's through our partners at the American University of Iraq, Suleimani, that we're gathering this content. They're actually the ones who are spearheading it and they're working with students and members of the community there to go out and try to find content that uh, they, they think is of interest and worthy of preserving. And then they're building, um, uh, working with us to build uh, more digital content and a website that will present this to the world. Hi, Jeff Garrett, uh, CRL consultant. Hi. Um, I know you've been working uh, with CDL and Harvard on something called Cobweb. Uh, mm -hmm. And it seems to me that there is an enormous potential uh, to use this software, as new as it is, to find uh, institutional partners in a post-custodial way uh, for a lot of these endangered archives. And uh, because uh, the map itself was quite impressive, I think uh, a lot of us have no idea in area studies that uh, there are so many archives out there that would benefit from technological expertise and and uh, you know preservation expertise. I, I wonder if there's been any thinking along these lines at UCLA. Well, we've we've uh, definitely thought about how best to make connections with a variety of other projects that are springing up. Um, so, the Digital Library of the Middle East, a clear funded project, is one that we've we've talked about, and we've had conversations with Clear, and we're we're thinking about um, how how we can both join forces and avoid. Uh, doing duplicate work and and identify what the priorities are. But I, I would say um, it's definitely been a challenge to figure out how to link up all of these initiatives because there are a lot. There's um, the Digital Library of the Caribbean is another one. We've been in touch with the University of Florida 
about that project and um, and definitely have agreed to collaborate, but that's at a very high level and doing the actual work to make that happen, we haven't figured out. With Cobweb, um, absolutely we're very interested in figuring out how to, how to gather web content and really make it available. Our approach at this point has been to identify areas of specific interest to us because of where we've been collecting already and to try to, to um, capture those web archives. But it's, you know, that's an arena where maybe CRL could help convene a, a conversation about how to bring all of these efforts together. All right, thank you.